Good morning, Park Street, and welcome to our online service this Sunday morning, the 25th of April. And if you're a visitor, a very warm welcome to you, and my name is Wayne Sell, and I will be leading us through the service this morning. I'd just like to start off by reading from the book of John, chapter 1, and the first 16 verses. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is the, in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. It's amazing, isn't it? I just want to go back to those words from verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. And that's where we are. When we choose to follow Jesus, when we put our trust in hope, when we call him Lord and Saviour, when we recognise that he's the Son of God, we're adopted into God's family, we are children of God. That makes us brothers and sisters. That's just amazing. That we have more in common with a Christian on the other side of the world, really, with our own family, because of Jesus Christ who unites us. And we have quite a, I have quite a favourite song at Park Streets, and it's called The Big Family of God. And we're going to sing that next, thanks to Joe, Paul and Sam. And it's one that requires action, so if you're at home, get up. Wiggle those hands and knees, do the actions. And if you're in church with me, I expect you to be standing up now, because I will. We want to keep those, um, that heartbeat going a bit faster, doing some exercise. So we're going to stand and sing. Sorry, we're going to stand and hum the big family of God. Unless you're at home where you can sing.
Did you enjoy that? I hope you're not too exhausted. I do hope you did those actions. I will be checking up on you. I can't wait to be able to get together in a church as a church family and be able to sing that song. The thing about being a family is sometimes our family members have to move away. And just recently, uh, our dear sister Sue had to move to Paul and she is missed as part of the Park Street Fellowship. She just sent a letter and I'd just like to share that letter with you. I know we've all had difficult times during this pandemic, but I wanted to tell you about my experience in the hope that it will be an encouragement. These short words cannot really express the agony I went through. I never thought I would move. I thought I'd be in my Park Street home till I died. I haven't moved before. I came to Park Street from my parents' house. I've been in the same house in Park Street for more than 44 years. As I did not have much money, I thought it best to divide my house and rent part out to get an income. I have problems with my heart and I've been blue lighted to A&E a few times. My children were too far away and when my first grandchild was born, with a request for assistance, I decided to sell my house and buy one new in my children. I gave my tenant notice in October 2019, but I would not be renewing their tenancy due to end in March 2020. I needed to be in pool at the latest for the beginning of September. My tenant asked for an extra month then COVID happened and I couldn't get them out. As my tenant kept saying, when you sell, we'll move out, but didn't mean it. I proceeded trying to sell my house when the government allowed. My heart was getting worse. I eventually had a lockdown telephone appointment with a cardiologist in June 2020. I was told that I needed an operation, but it would be at least Christmas before that was likely. Fortunately, God intervened as I was so stressed trying to sell and my tenant not going that my heart was really bad. And I had an op at the end of June 2020. We are in God's hands. He knows what we need and when things are getting unbearable, it was amazing and apt that I had that op as it improved my heart. Not cured, but good enough to bear the stress. Well, things were extremely stressful. I had a purchaser, so offered to buy but my tenant kept saying they were leaving and then not. The government had ruled that I would not be able to remove them for at least six months, probably a year. But I was needed to be in pool in September. The whole situation was getting to be unbearable. When eventually, very late at night in October, my tenant left. What a relief. Then my purchaser pulled out. I just hoped my vendors in pool would hold on till I got another purchaser. I got another purchaser and after a couple of months tried to get to exchange to happen. It was suggested that it would happen just before Christmas. Great, I could see my family for Christmas, but no, COVID regulations meant Christmas on my own. Removal companies were busy, so I was advised to book dates and hope for exchange. I had to alter these dates three times. Then just when I was thinking I would have to change the dates again, Almost at the last minute, contracts were exchanged. This was very stressful, and again my heart began to play up a few times. I can't do anything when it does, and I'm so tired afterwards. However, I do think that this was God's timing. He knew I couldn't move earlier, and needed that extra time to sort the accumulation of over 44 years all by myself. For me, I can see God's hand in all these things. 
Things were awful, but he ensured that they did not become unbearable. He cares and looks after us. We might be going through bad times, but he comforted, comforted to know that he holds us in his hands and will help us through. Often setbacks and problems happen for our benefit. As it says, all things work for good of those who love the Lord. We may, we may not think so, and sometimes, even in hindsight, we wonder. I think if I hadn't had a tenant, things would have been easier, but I have grown in my faith far more than if it was easier. I can see God's hand in supplying my need for that operation at that time so amazingly sooner than expected. If the tenant hadn't stayed, I wouldn't have clung to my rock of Jesus so desperately, and that helped me through. And the trials getting, ex and the trials getting exchanged, delayed, meant that I had sufficient time to do enough sorting to feel okay about moving. I still wonder that things didn't work out so well and a removal company as I only left Park Street at 10 to 5 when it was getting dark, extremely tired and a back that doesn't like to drive for more than one hour, which is when I must thank many of you who prayed for me my move as it was okay. It took me over two hours but my back stayed good and I managed to find my new house in the dark alone never having driven there before, to thank you and thank to our Lord. I still haven't unpacked and all the boxes and all have to find reliable workmen like the ones I knew in Park Street. And a dentist, they're not taking on new patients for the rest of this year and I have half a tooth in my gum. However, I do know that everything will work out ultimately and it will be for our benefit. I still have to grow in trust. Nevertheless, we may be imperfect, but God uses us just as we are, and he loves us and cares for us. Hold on to that. He wants for the best for us and will protect us and guide us. That's love from Sue. So, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for Sue. We thank you for that she was part of our church family, and she is still part of our family. Lord, we pray that for you would guide her and give her wisdom and peace as she carries on with this move, uh, as she settles in in Paul. Lord, and again, I just want to thank you for the whole of Park Street, the whole of this fellowship. I pray that each and every one of them would just know that you are by their side, that you are with them every step of the way, that you have promised to never leave them or forsake them, that you care for each and every one of them, that you sent your one and only son to this earth, to live and then to die on that cross for us. And then he defeated death and he rose again. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you for your plan for us. Lord, we thank you that you are the good, good Father. Amen. We're going to sing our next two songs, which is Good, Good Father. And all the people said Amen. You are 
reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23 through to chapter 2 verse 11. I call God as my witness and I stake my life on it that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith but we work with you for your joy because it is by faith you stand firm. 
so I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad, but you whom I've grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you, that you would all share my joy. For I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him, so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Good morning. Uh, this is the third in our series on Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and today we're in chapter 1, verse 23, to chapter 2, verse 11. When things go wrong, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will open our minds to understand your word, and open our hearts to receive the truth that you want to put firmly in there, that we may obey and trust in you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Some of you may be aware that I am very fond of the Peanuts cartoon strips by Schultz. Here's a conversation between two Peanuts characters, Charlie Brown and Lucy, as they lean on a fence. Charlie, do you think the world will end in our time? Lucy, I try not to think about such things. Charlie, well now that I've brought it to your attention, what do you think? Lucy, when things that I try not to think about are brought to my attention, I try not to think about them. Charlie, well when things that are, oh forget it. We're good at following Lucy's practice, not just about the end of the world, what someone in Agatha Christie's Poirot might describe as unpleasantness. Take for instance, the breakdown in relationships within the local church. The Corinthian church in Paul's day, it seems, had been unsettled by one member who had vehemently criticised Paul and his apostolic ministry among them. Many had continued to side with Paul, but they had done nothing about the situation. Paul had written to them a challenging letter, which we now don't have. From what is said in 2 Corinthians, this missing letter had a very positive effect on the Corinthian church. The majority had repented of their inactivity and dealt with the offender, I guess something like withdrawing fellowship from him. In turn, the offender had repented of his actions. And in the part of the letter we are considering today, we find Paul following up this situation by explaining why he did what he did, which is write them a letter instead of a second visit. And then Paul dealing with the aftermath of that situation. Of course, you may still want to ask, why are we looking at this issue at all? Some years ago, I attended a series of lectures on the Corinthian letters by the then principal of London Bible College, Gilbert Kirby. He began nearly every lecture in the series by reminding us, sadly, just how relevant these letters are today to the problems of the church in the West at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. What were once thought to be irrelevant issues are now becoming increasingly commonplace. So am I suggesting that we are facing a Corinthian situation at Holy Trinity or Park Street Baptist Church? No, but the danger is real enough. Paul gave the ultimate reason for his actions in chapter 2 verse 11. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. The attack of Satan. He can destroy the effectiveness of an otherwise thriving church fellowship by causing rifts within the church. Indeed, it's one of the best ways of damaging its work. We need to be on our guard. We need to learn from Paul. And there could be a number of possible outcomes to such a situation if we don't always learn from him.
Of course, there's the Lucy approach. Ignore the problem and all will be well. Only it doesn't work. There are three other options, although Paul would probably have rejected two of them. Accept that there is a broken fellowship. The local church divides over the issue and becomes two Bible-believing congregations in the area that are not speaking to one another. To Paul, that would have been a scandal. Well, what about having a disabled fellowship? The reason why doing nothing and hoping for the best does not work. The cause of the dispute is not dealt with and it becomes a festering sore. The fellowship may appear united, but it lives with reduced effectiveness. Again, Paul would not have accepted that. But what about the healed fellowship? The problem is dealt with and relationships are restored. And Paul's aim was for nothing less than that in his relationship with the, Phili the Corinthian church and his relationship and relationships within the Corinthian church. And that is the perspective of this whole letter, in fact. The conditions for healing had already been met. This was not a theoretical solution. What we learn about primarily from Paul's attitude is the source of that healing. So let us look to the path to a healing fellowship, uh, sorry, a path to the healed fellowship in Paul's attitude and relationship with the Corinthian church. So what is this path to a healed fellowship? Well, first of all, we see Paul's love in action. While we don't have the contents of the previous letter that was so effective, we do have a record in this letter of Paul's attitude towards the Corinthians, the attitude which motivated that previous letter. And presumably the Corinthians had good reason for believing Paul because they preserved this letter for future generations. And what we see as the starting point for healing is that Paul's love is real in action. Look at verse 23 of chapter 1. I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. And then again later in chapter 2 verses 3 and 4. I wrote as I did so that when I came I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Writing this earlier letter had clearly caused Paul a lot of pain. But he saw it was better for them than a visit. A visit that could only have been effective if it had included a strong element of judgment against them. They had thought he was double-minded forever changing his plans, whereas in fact his actions had been motivated by love for them, regardless of the cost to himself. Paul was no superhuman. That love for them derived from the depth of Christ's love for him. And that same love is available to us today. Love for us that is so great that we can forget about securing our own position. What do I want out of this situation? And concentrate in love on what is best for the other members of the fellowship. And that leads us to Paul's second attitude towards them in that step towards the healing. He sees them as co-workers, not as a master-servant relationship. Chapter 1, verse 24 says, Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. Paul had founded this church, as he had founded many others, and he had a parent's concern for them. Yet he could rejoice in seeing them share in the gospel ministry with him as a sign of their faith in Jesus Christ. And a step on the path to fellowship, to fellowship well-being, is recognising each other as co-workers. It carries with it the idea of mutual respect, a recognition that God's grace is for all of us. The Holy Spirit is at work in and through each one of us, through you and me, or through every one of us in the fellowship. If that other person is my co-worker, sharing with me in God's grace, then I'd better do all I can to ensure that nothing harms our relationship. We are to be co-workers, not masters and servants. But then Paul takes it one step further. He saw their relationship not simply as co-workers, because that could still be in the sense of you work over there and I work over there and we don't have much contact. But he sees it more as one of mutual dependence 
chapter 2 verse 2 says for I agree if I grieve you who who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved even an apostle of Christ was dependent on others as they were dependent on him it's not simply that they would be so much weaker in their ministry if they turned their backs on Paul without their support for him Paul would be weaker in his ministry and he wanted them to realize it despite what the church has done with it down the ages ministry in the New Testament terms is not a pyramid with a higher power status the further up the pyramid you go rather it's a body with all parts subject to the one head Jesus Christ it functions differently but equality of status under the head even though there is difference in functions and all working together for the good of the whole body together for the good of the whole body and the more this mutual dependence grows even at the risk of being let down by some the more the church functions as the body of Christ is intended to be so what did Paul expect to see coming from the Corinthian church in this situation he expected the next step which is the united action of the fellowship the attacks by this one man it seems have primarily been against Paul possibly challenging his apostolic ministry yet Paul saw the main suffering was caused by this man to the church Look at verse 5 of chapter 2 if anyone has caused grief he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent not to put it too severely if the rest of the church had gone along with this one man they would have denied themselves the benefits of Paul's ministry. Instead, the public display of antagonism had been challenged by the majority. Rather than a, a destructive two-way power struggle between the offender and the pastor, Paul in this case, the majority had been brought to their senses and applied a suitable sanction. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him, says Paul in verse 6. Possibly there had been, as I said, some form of withdrawal of fellowship. A serious, potentially divisive attitude in this man had been challenged by a large part of the church. And the results had been effective. Their change of heart about what to do had been instrumental in changing the man's heart. True, of course, this situation may never happen. But there could be potentially times when we have a collective responsibility to bring about healed relationships within the fellowship. It's just not somebody else's job. Individually, we may not get very far with it, but a willingness to act together in truth may not just prevent a split within the church. It will be a step to, along the path to full healing of those relationships. Don't put down what the church can do together, for that is a great strength in God's plans. And the result? Repentance. A forgiveness then comes which can restore. It's so much so that Paul saw the man was in danger of being overwhelmed by sorrow. The truth had hit home. If he had not, if it had not, he would have remained hard hearted and unrepentant. Many would have said that what he did was just the effect we wanted to see in such a situation. He repented, great. But repentance is not simply about saying sorry or even about the depth of one's sorrow. It's about recognising one's guilt before God and desiring to go a different God-directed way. Paul's response could have been along the lines that are common today. Good, he's admitted his guilt, now we can get on without him. His actual response was that there should be forgiveness that leads to restoration. Look at chapter 2, verses 7 to 10. Now instead you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to re reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. Forgive and comfort him, so that he is not overwhelmed by sorrow. Reaffirm your love for him. Even express Paul's forgiveness for him. This is not saying what you have done does not matter because it is sin and sin always matters. 
It is saying, though, that we will treat you as God treats you, as though you are as righteous as Christ. It is a forgiven people living out the forgiveness they have received. That's not an easy task, but a vital one. In, in the sight of Christ, we see in verse 10b, And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. It's a reminder that giving forgiveness like receiving forgiveness is only possible through our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not natural for us to forgive each other. Equally, the destruction of broken or disabled relationships cannot be healed by sweeping them under the carpet. They can only be dealt with when it is recognised for what they are, rebellion against God. And God's forgiveness through his son is applied to those situations. Only then can we say with Paul in verse 11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Every individual act of forgiveness that restores is part of Christ's great victory over Satan. Later on in chapter 10 and verse 8, Paul hints to the Corinthians at his ultimate purpose, something that gives him real genuine joy for even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than pulling you down I will not be ashamed of it he writes authority from the Lord for building you up rather than pulling you down I trust we have seen that that authority at work in the healing of Paul's relationships with the Corinthian church and it leads us to a readiness in each of us to see that work in our relationships with one another building up rather than pulling down. This is love in action. Seeing each other as working together, co-workers, expressing our mutual dependence, willingness to go God's way, and expressing forgiveness that restores. If we do share those God-given attitudes, we will find that they are what prevent broken relations in the first place, as well as what helps towards healing them when they have been damaged. So let us consider how we would be part of the whole church in seeking to restore broken relationships rather than accepting a rift. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us a great guidance on how we are to act towards one another when things don't go well. We pray, Father, we will not sweep them under the carpet, but apply your principles, your words, to bring about the healing of relationship, forgiveness, repentance and new life through Jesus. For we ask it in his name. Amen. My worth is not in what I own Not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flows.
my 